Hi, good evening. So um, every week um, at 8 p.m. we do a um, live blog um, for our, um, well really we do a live blog on the news from Zimmer and Peacock um, for this week. So um, today is the 23rd of May 2021. Hi, good evening. So, uh... so I just checking that the volume is coming through. So today is the um, 23rd of May 2021. And this is a look back at the news from Zimmer and Peacock for the week um, starting the, uh, let's check the calendar, the 17th of May uh, 2021. So every week we do this kind of retrospective look back at the sort of um, news from Zimmer and Peacock for this week. And um, that's that sort of retrospective look. We're also going to do something a little bit different um, this week as well because um, we run the ZP Developer Zone and we have a lot of inquiries from people, you know, they're asking questions and one questioner was like, I need to answer really quickly. And I, and we said, okay, well, we'll respond to your question um, next Thursday at 8 a.m. in our ZP Developer Zone forum. And um, they were pretty keen um, to have a response. So um, we said, okay, well, well, we'll do it this evening. So it's going to be a little bit different tonight. So we, we will do the news, um, but we're also going to do some um, CP developer zone um, questions as well, specifically on doing sweat analysis. Um, so news, first of all, then a discussion on sweat analysis. And this is a live um, video log and it's a live podcast. So I appreciate Ali um, being online. It's nice to see you this evening. So first of all, let's just dive into um, a little note that we put up there this week. Um, so we put a little note up regarding um, cell culture. So, you know, when you're growing um, cells, be it, you know, E. coli, you're sort of doing tissue engineering or you're doing some sort of um, yeah, expression using or expressing using um, E. coli. Um, people often have, you know, the cells in a certain condition. And what's always kind of struck me is, um, you know, people are very good at controlling the kind of um, the genetics of the E. coli, for example, but how well are they really measuring the chemical conditions of their um, of their cell culture or their bioreactor? So something that we've been quite interested in in, in quite a while at Zimmer and Peacock is actually biosensing, but in um, cell culture and tissue engineering. And we've got some collaborations that are developing where it looks like we'll be sponsoring some uh, PhDs to do obviously three year PhDs. And we'd like them to do it around the areas of um, putting biosensors into cell culture. So the reason this note has come about is because we are going to sponsor these PhDs. There could be quite a few of them and it will be specifically on putting these sensors into their experiments. And so we kind of wrote a, you know, a note that, you know, Biosensors are good for people doing cell culture work because you can sort of do this, you know, quantitative analysis, you know, how much glucose or how much oxygen or how much lactate or how much ethanol, um, what's the pH. You can do that using biosensors in a um, continuous um, fashion. First of all, they're quantitative. So, you know, what is the pH or how much glucose is there or how much oxygen is there? These are important parameters. And obviously, you know, if the oxygen is higher in an aerobic situation, if it's low, you're in an anaerobic situation. If the glucose is too high, then it could be a you know a toxic environment. And if it's too low, essentially you know this the cells might be sort of starving. So it is good to have. Um, I think you know the good to know what the chemical state of a bioreactor or cell culture is. And the nice thing about a lot of the biosensors that we develop, um, they can provide longitudinal data that. Our glucose sensor, uh, because the enzyme is immobilized, it carries on working and doesn't just get washed into the cell culture. So you get quantitative data um, and longitudinal data. And then rather interestingly, we've been working more and more using arrays. And I think this comes more into play with people who are doing maybe tissue engineering, um, where if you have an array and you're sort of growing tissue um, on top of the array, we can actually tell you what the um, pH or what the glucose is in a spatial um, manner. So I think that's pretty, um, well at least to us it's quite interesting. So um, we are interested in cell culture and tissue engineering. There's a lot of research going on. We're going to sponsor some PhDs in it 
and we're going to have them using the biosensors that we have to measure you know the simple well, simple enough things you know glucose lactate these are simple enough pH sodium potassium um, but we can do quantitative longitudinal measurements and also spatial measurements um, and because Ali is watching I'll just kind of um, let him know that we do have these kind of electrodes where you've kind of got nine working electrodes and we've been mostly um, functionalizing these nine working electrodes so that we can actually measure pH but the software that we've been sort of developing you can kind of see the you know if you put a, a high pH at one side of the solution and it diffuses across we can actually see that change in pH um, as the diffusion takes place which I think is um, you know interesting and should have some pretty cool applications so Long story short, we're going to sponsor some more PhDs and we're going to be placing biosensors into cell culture because we think if you've got better measurement over the conditions, you can have more control over the um, experiment. If you want to improve it, you better measure it first. Um, this is really cool. Um, I'm delighted Ali's online this evening. So um, this is something that we're going to be promoting through our blog. Um, it should be up on things like LinkedIn and um, it's up on YouTube and we'll put it through the Facebook site and through um, Twitter, etc. So one of our um, ZP Developers Zone members did a really cool um, video on um, ion selective field effect transistors. And um, I mean, it's kind of a 50 minute long video, but the, con and the content is very good and the quality is very high. So I'm really keen on that. And I noticed that we... This Ali was kind enough to make it, this video, and I think it's had kind of 56 views already. When And when you consider sort of niche videos like this, you know, then that's um, pretty good. So we, we're happy that that's getting traction. So um, we are delighted to have people like Ali uh, um, in the ZP Developer Zone. And, you know, when people can sort of, you know, give back to the community as well, we're really appreciative of that as well. So that was a pretty cool um, video this week that went out there. Um, we we did a lot about gold this week. We've been um, having a lot of inquiries recently, and it just happens that these inquiries have also have also um, coordinated with. We've been doing a lot of sputtering of gold electrodes. I haven't. I can't really dive into it too deeply at the moment, but. Um, we're known for doing screen printing of gold, and you know if you ever came to our facility, we you know we're screen we're screen printing gold electrodes. We're using um, self-assemble monolayers, and we're functionalizing these gold electrodes with um, antibodies and essentially turning them into biosensors. So that's something we do quite regularly, and we do it often by screen printing. But no, we also actually do vapor deposition, and as the and we're basically just trying to bring down the cost. Screen printing is low cost. Vapor deposition is a little more. Um, um, vapor deposition is um, a little more expensive. Um, but we are. Um, we do like the sort of precision of vapor deposition and the quality of the surface. And some of the work we've been doing recently is showing that vapor deposited gold. You know, we can use it. Um, it has actually been used by, you know, many glucose companies to make their gold electrodes. So it does have a good um, industrial track record. Um, and at ZP, we're just trying to get the cost down at the moment. Something else that we put out there this week as well is there's a lot of people. All right, sorry. I think I might have had a little break then in my um, in my streaming, but hopefully it didn't affect um, things too much. Down at the moment. Something else that. We I just want to I hope hopefully not anyway um, so some more work that we put out there this week um, uh, we also did a, a quick article about um, the nitrogen sensor that we do at Zimmer and Peacock so Zimmer and Peacock we are making a um, nitrogen sensor and um, we know it gives a, an advantage to the farmers um, but we also believe it gives a good advantage to the environment as well. Just drop a quick note. 
Right. Um, so we have this nitrate sensor. It's um, very good for measuring um, the nitrate in soil. But we also, you know, of course, realize that it has an environmental impact as well because um, um, if the um, if the nitrate is over added to the fields, then it essentially can run into the into the water um, and lead to kind of algae blooms, which can then lead to a depletion in oxygen, which can lead to kind of you know um, things like you know the fish dying and and um, unfortunately. So at Zero Peacock we work on a number of sensors. I mean, so far today we talked about lactate, uh, sodium potassium has probably been mentioned. Now I'm mentioning nitrates and the nitrate sensor is more for the agricultural applications. But when you're helping farmers with precision agriculture, you're also helping the environment because, you know, you, you, you know, nobody wants to add more fertilizer than is absolutely necessary because it's a waste of money, let alone being an, envi you know, an environmental problem. And so our um, nitrate sensor um, has an advantage that it limits the amount of nitrogen. And I think that once people kind of, you know, once we start getting a grip on CO2, I think the next, you know, sort of pollutant that we're really going to have to go after is nitrate. And I think um, carbon dioxide and nitrate are actually linked because one of the a big producer of CO2 in the world is actually the Bourne Harbor process which is for making all these nitrates and ammonium fertilizers. So quick summary, at Zimmer Peacock, we are making a nitrate sensor. That nitrate sensor will help farmers. It will also help the environment and it actually helps the environment in two ways. Locally, because you don't add more nitrate than you really need. So you don't get local water pollution. And globally it helps because actually one of the biggest contributors to carbon dioxide um, in the world is actually the Bourne Harbor process which produces nitrates for fertilizer applications. So the um, nitrate sensor is a great sensor um, on many um, fronts, let's say, and we're quite happy with it. Um, we also, it's, it's again linked to the, um, to the nitrate sensor, but we're also very um, keen on the um, you know, we're getting very involved in the Internet of Things at Zimmer and Peacock. So uh, it's great being a biosensor company. It's great doing sputtered gold and screen printed electrodes. But this is really just the start of the journey for us because, um, you know, if you're going to make a nitrate sensor and you're going to put it in a farmer's field. So what? You know, the farmer's got to have something actionable information. And so at ZP, you know, we're very keen on um, taking that data sending it to the cloud, doing analytics on it so that data can become information and then giving information to the farmer who can actually take some action upon it. So it's not just talk with us. This is really what we're all about. You know, the sensor is just the start of the journey. And some of you who follow us on, well, some of you who part of the developer zone, for example, you'll know all about Julie. And, and that's actually part of our journey about becoming this total solution from sensing to the farmer applying his nitrate on his on his farm you know but in order to complete that journey there's many elements that we we're having to take care of there and i'll actually talk about that in a little bit anyway so i won't go too deep on that um, this week we did the developer zone and as i say we did a whole video on gold electrodes for um, biosensing so i'm not gonna um touch um, too much on that now but something that we did um, put out there this week is um, we're quite keen on um, really making available um, files for people to 3d print microfluidics so I'm just going to scroll through if you're watching on the video log I'm just going to scroll through some images now um, that we put up there um, just this week and essentially you know we're big proponents of obviously of our own products and we're big proponents of something called the hypervalue electrode which I just happened to have one here on my desk so these are got screen printed electrodes but you know how part of what makes a sensor a sensor is is bringing these samples to the sensor and often in the lab we can do that quite easily we can just pipette the sample on but in the real world it doesn't work like that you know people don't have pipettes they don't have those kind of skills 
So at ZP, we're quite interested in allowing at least scientists and engineers to prototype um, flow cells so that, so that actually solutions could be brought onto sensors quite easily. Um, sometimes it should be flow cells. Sometimes it should be what we call capillary fill um, sensors. But at ZP, we've been busy 3D printing all these um, objects and then we're making them available through our um, developer zone so that you know scientists and engineers and developers can um, print these um, devices themselves and it just accelerates them on their own on, on their own development so let me just um, yeah if you go to the ZP developer zone, you'll find that it says that these that you know that these like 125 euros. But we also say, look, if you're a ZP developer zone member, just contact us and we'll give you a 100% discount code, so it won't cost you um, anything. So let me just summarize this. Though so, um, a sensor involves many elements. You know, there could be an electrode involved. There could be a bio recognition molecule involved. But a really important part of it is also how to bring the sample to the the sensor because if you don't bring that sample to the sensor in a reproducible fashion it can influence your signal and give you big error bars so sometimes if you want to bring your error bars down you have to sort out how the sample actually reaches the sensor and that's why we're making uh, 3d printable microfluidics available through the developer zone because we don't think that's the way people are going to manufacture it but it at least help them in their prototyping especially sort of in re in the research context so that's why we're sort of busy doing that at the moment. Um, and then lastly, I sort of, this is what I was touching upon um, earlier on, um, which is um, turning biosensing into actionable information. So this is kind of something that we're, you know, if we look at the ZP nitrate sensor, it's a biosensor that sits in the soil. It gives out um, a millivolt signal. So this is the entire journey now I want to describe from sensor all the way through to actionable information. So you've got a sensor, it gives you, for example, in this in this what in this example, millivolts. You have to convert that millivolts into essentially into digital, into bytes. So we have an analog digital conversion. Um, and then in this modern world, you know, you don't just do that analog to digital conversion and show the result. I mean, these days now, you know, most things are connected, you know, and we want to send data. Yeah, so Ali's just asking, can these be used for online monitoring? And that's really what I want to talk about because, you know, we want to sense, we want to collect that raw signal, we want to convert it into a digital signal, we want to transmit it to the, um, to the cloud and so some of you who are starting to use Julie know that we, you know, we can upload data to the cloud um, into our Julie database. We've actually got hardware that can automatically upload the data to the Julie database. So especially, you, for example, you, you know, especially somebody like Ali, I want to give him that, that idea that actually, you know, grab the data. Yeah, we've got sensors. They're continuously monitoring. They're continually producing, for example, millivolts. We've got the electronics in place to continuously convert the millivolts into a digital signal. We can wirelessly transmit it to Julie, which is something we're already doing. So now we have Julie continuously receiving the data. And there we're using APIs now. Um, and an API is basically a piece of software that sort of sits between two other pieces of software. And it will allow us to actually transmit the data then to um, an application specific interface or uh, that's specific to the farmer because the farmer doesn't want to look at Julie. Um, Julie is a database that's very good for scientists and academics and researchers and people like Zimmer and Peacock and people like our collaborators. Farmers don't want to look at that. Farmers want to look at something that's more meaningful to the farmer. And so we have to have this century second interface and you can, you can um, send data between two, in, um, two different pieces of software using an API. So there's a long journey from sensing through to something that the farmer, for example, can be used and can use. But, you know, even though I'm talking about sensing and farmers now, I could also be talking about sensing and the doctor or sensing and the patient. It's the same journey all the way through. You've got a sensor, 
which gives you an analog signal which has to be converted to a digital signal which often these days now gets transmitted to the cloud we can process the data in the cloud and then we want to display it to the end user in a way that's meaningful so i think it's you know if you're a, if you're interested in biosensing you know many of us who have these academic backgrounds you know we focus in very closely on the biosensor but there's an entire system here that we have to actually think about and so at zp we we do sort of think about um, the entire system and that's why julie is is coming and getting better so i think um that was essentially all the news that we had um, from ZP this week. Uh, what I wanted to uh, do now is actually just change gears slightly and um, answer some questions that came in um, via our website. So, yeah. So I often do this, or we often do this on a Thursday at 8 a.m. We do a, a live streaming for our ZP Developer Zone. But this week, um, one of the members would, wanted an answer over the weekend. Um, so um, we've been uh, doing that. So let me just jump into it a little bit. So if you're a member of the ZP Developer Zone, you know this already, that we have... Um, uh, forums and webinars and collaborations and jobs in the ZP Academy. So it's quite a rich um, environment in the ZP Developer Zone. Now, um, we ask people to ask their questions in what's called our research forum, um, which um, people do. They're, they're kind enough to put their questions up there. So this week we had two questions. One of them was about screen printed carbon electrodes. And I'm going to answer that um, at Thursday at 8 a.m. But I also noticed that Ali gave an answer to this as well and I agreed with his his answer. Um, but we'll go over that uh, Thursday at 8 a.m. But what I wanted to do this evening was answer some questions about sweat sensors. So I appreciate that um, we haven't got all the evening, but I just want to jump into the sweat sensing technology. Um, so at Zimmer and Peacock, we get asked questions about sweat sensors and this week we've been asked about measuring sodium, potassium, and lactate um, in sweat. So I'll discuss that. Now, on our website, you'll find um, some illustrations, or not illustrations, but some uh, products or some pictures of sweat patches that we've made. So um, if you follow with Zimmer and Peacock, you'll know that we're quite interested in microfluidics. Earlier on, I was having a conversation about 3D printed microfluidics. Now we're talking about laminates, or laminates rather, um, where we basically laser cut or die cut or knife cut materials and we stack them on top of each other in order to make little channels and capillaries. So if you want to make a sweat sensor, then we think um, it's simple enough, for example, you know, you can buy sodium, potassium and lactate sensors from Zimmer and Peacock, that's simple enough. But of course, you've then got to bring the sweat to the sensor. And that's really part of the conversation I was having earlier on, which is, you know, that's why we, you know, we do this 3D printing of things because we're trying to make channels to bring samples to the sensor. But sweat, wearable sensors and sweat sensors is one of the most challenging things because, you know, it's one thing to have something static on the, on the bench, but trying to make something that's, you know, um, robust enough to be worn is really quite tough. So it is tough to make a sweat sensor. The honest answer is to do things something like this properly. If you were a company or a startup, you're talking millions of dollars to do this really properly. But um, at least proof of principle, let's dive into proof of principles anyway. Um, so at Zimmer Peacock, you'll find that we have sodium, potassium, lactate sensors. You'll also find some images on our website regarding um, make, making old microfluidics or sweat sensors. And you'll also find some um, images showing um, something called the Easy Flex. So the Easy Flex for ZP now has been around for um, quite a few years. And the Easy Flex is a small flexible electronics board, it's about 25 millimeters by 25 millimeters, and you can plug sensors into that. Now the Easy Flex um, is Bluetooth enabled. In fact, I'll hover my mouse here. This is the Bluetooth um, aerial here. So that will connect to uh, 
we connect it to a PC because most of the time we're using this kind of board for development work. So we do connect it to a PC and in a bit I'll show you that we actually have some software for this um, which is downloadable off the website. So in fact um, if you go to our website and any links that I use or any references I make in this video log or podcast um, regarding the website I will put those videos um, in the comments um, underneath the video as well. But there is some software you can download. So one of the questions we were asked is, if I get one of your sodium or potassium or your lactate sensors, how can I get the data off it? Um, and the answer is, you can plug it into the sensors. Sorry, you can plug it into the Easy Flex. It will make Bluetooth connection with a PC as long as you've got the software on there, and you can get your data off that way. It'll come. I think the file format is either CSV or text, but it's something that you can open up um, in Excel. So you can get the data off it. But I do want to um, sort of say, talk about the Easy Flex. So Easy Flex is something that we use at, Z, at Zimmer and Peacock, and we like it. But I think it's a technology where you kind of need quite a good engineering background as well as a science background. Um, and it's really your first step on the path to making a product. If you're really in your research phase, I think I want to talk about other technologies that are useful if you're in academia or you're doing research. And I just want to say that the um, the easy sorry EC Flex is supported by a lot of videos, and there's a link here. Um, so these videos will hopefully help people understand um, this technology. But my advice for kind of academia and academics is actually the Sense It Smart. Um, the reason being is this that the Easy Flex, you know, is good. We use it um, in house, uh, but we have to program it either to work with ion selective electrodes, or we have to use it to work with um, amperometric electrodes, for example. So that's it. Doesn't have that much flexibility, you know. It can do either or, and that's why I'm a bit more of a fan. If I if I'm studying my research phase. Um, I'd actually suggest the Sense It Smart because it's it's a pretty good potential stat um, that's got a very small form factor, and so it feels like a wearable sensor. Um, at least it's getting close to being a wearable sensor, but it's still a f you know a, fu a fairly fully functional potential stat. You know, so my adv unfortunately my advice is. Um, if you're a startup company that's truly trying to make a wearable sensor and you've got a good engineering term, team rather, I'd go for the Easy Flex. If you're in academia and you need to use this, this electronics for different types of sensors, maybe the lactate, the sodium and the potassium, then you need something that's more of a laboratory instrument. And I think the closest one there then is actually the Sense It Smart. Uh, unfortunately there as well, the Sense It Smart is actually got a, a more attractive price as well so I'm not doing doing down the easy flex but I, I am saying that if you're trying to do um, lab based proof of principle studies on sweat I would be more inclined to use the sense it's smart than the easy flex it's more flexible the software is allows it to be more flexible you can run amperometric sensing as well as potentiometric sensing and the cost is lower. And then if you want to use it in other projects where you need voltammetry, for example, you can also use it um, there as well. So like I say, I'll link to that um, underneath the video. We do have an awful lot of material supporting the Sense It Smart on the ZP website. So you'll see, um, I'll put a link to this as well, but you'll see that you know, one of the questions was, I want to measure sweat and I want to measure sodium potassium. You'll see on the ZP website that we use the Sense It Smart to measure um, pH. Um, so that's essentially a form of ion selective electrode. So it can do sodium, potassium, and things like pH, no sweat. And you'll also see that we've got a couple of videos where we measure glucose. So if somebody asks me, you know, um, will the Sense It Smart measure lactate in sweat? Yes, it will. Well, why do you believe that? Because we use it to measure glucose quite regularly. Um, and um, if you know anything about biosensors, then uh, lactate and glucose sensors um, are fairly similar. Um, and I'll put a link to that as well. So, in um, 
at ZP we do have a lot of technologies for doing sweat monitoring people who want to do proof of principle studies we have the sensors themselves we have the patches we do have the EZ flex with its Bluetooth connection um, and also to support the EZ flex we also have some DXF files so if you've got an engineering buddy you can download these files and you can make your own kind of um, let's say box or container for the for the electronics but my my recommendation is um, if you're going to be doing early R&D work on wearable type sensors I'd actually go for the easy uh, I'd rather go for the sense it's smart um, lower cost more flexibility more suitable for early research if you're a startup company with engineers then I would suggest the easy flex um, just an alternative suggestion as well so at Zimmer and Peacock um, if somebody's interested in making lower cost lactate um, sodium potassium glucose type sensors let's just concentrate on the sodium potassium you can get these hyper value sensors of ZP um, they're 200 for 199 euros but you can also get these um, these um, functionalization solutions as well so essentially you can actually make your own sensors so you can buy the screen printed electrodes you can buy this functionalization solution and you can pipette that onto your set onto that onto your sensors or onto your electrodes rather and make your own sensor and i think if you're in academia this is quite an economic way of making um sensors i, I kind of calculated tonight um just quickly that it would cost you about 700 euros to make um 700 euros no it'd be more than that um well, to make to make yeah to make uh, about fifteen hundred euros to make a thousand um, sensors, a thousand sensors by the way sounds like a lot. It's not a lot in manufacturing terms, but I think to make if you buy the electrodes of ZP and you buy the solutions of ZP, you can probably make about a thousand electrodes for about fifteen hundred euros. I understand in some places that's you know it is it is an awful lot of money, but it's also an awful lot of sensors as well. So there's a different way of making sensors from ZP. You can just drop, buy the electrodes, buy the solutions and make them yourself. And that will reduce the cost a bit. So I'm just going to put some links um, to that here as well. And I also want to say we do have some videos on our website about how to activate screen printed electrodes to make them into iron selective electrodes. So um, if you're interested um, in making your own um, biosensors, then I'll put a link and you'll be able to watch um, one of our engineers doing it. I think the video is only about two minutes long. It's quite straightforward. Just talk about testing biosensors. And when I say testing biosensors, um, how to test, for example, one of our sodium sensors. And actually, before I go there, there's a, a lot of videos on our website about how to test biosensors. Um, so we have at least seven videos on how to test biosensors. And in these videos, there's how to test an oxygen sensor, potassium sensor, glucose sensor, pH, uric acid, sodium, and ammonium. So all these videos should give you a good sense of how to test um, biosensors. Um, this is the kind of data that we often get if we're looking at one of our sodium sensors. Um, so we have, um, we'll often sort of start off at a baseline concentration. So for example, um, we might start testing the, the sodium sensor at 40 millimolar and then take it to 80 millimolar then take it to 160 millimolar and then take it to 320 millimolar I'm just going to show you now how if you gather data like this how Julie can really speed up your analysis so I know that um, Ali and a few of you have already seen um, these kind of demonstrations but just bear with me, just let me do it quickly, just so that we can kind of, you know, really cement it in how to do this kind of um, work. So I'm just looking at, here we are. All right. I'm just logging into my um, Julie account. In fact, if you're looking for um, Julie, uh, I'm just gonna go to one of our websites so if you go to knowledge base, we have something called um, Julie. Um, you can log in here, but there's also an important part here where you can actually get free data. So what I'm doing tonight is I'm gonna to do it very quickly because some of you have seen this before, but 
this part of of the vlog and podcast tonight was about um, iron selective electrodes and pH electrodes is a classic example of iron selective electrodes. So we have some data up here about pH sensors. Um, what I did earlier on is I downloaded the data. So I'm just going to bring, I'm just going to drag onto the screen now um, something called um, Julie. So let me drag my screen in. Um, if you haven't seen this, then there is some training material obviously on our websites um, regarding all of this. But um, I'm talking about this because tonight we were talking about making um, a sodium or a potassium sensor for sweat. We also discussed lactate as well, but sodium and potassium ion selective electrodes. If you gather the data on something like the Sense It Smart, which we also discussed, I want to show you how you can process the data quite quickly as well. So I've opened up Julie. Julie is a free um, database system. It's, it's cloud-based. I said there was free software to, um, sorry, there was free data that you could get off um, our website. Um, I'm uploading that data now. So what I've done is I've uploaded four different experiments. And I'm gonna show you how quickly we can actually process um, that data. So I've uploaded the four files. I'm going to tell the database that this is um, potentiometry continuous. I don't know why we didn't call it continuous potentiometry, but we called it potentiometry continuous. Um, first of all, I'm just going to graph the data. So here is the data. So this is four experiments. Um, and I've essentially overlaid them all. They were all done separately, but I've overlaid them all. And you can see that um, we've been very disciplined at ZP that we've done experiments exactly in the same way. And I suppose that's an important point, see, because if you don't do the experiments, if you're trying to do biosensor development, it's probably very good to standardize your testing. And that's what we do. We're an ISO 13485 company. So we've got these four experiments. Um, I've uploaded the data very quickly. Now I want to show you how we can analyze it quite quickly. So I'm going to fit the data. I'm going to do some statistical evaluation on it and we'll see how that works. Now, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell the database something about the data. Well, when I say something, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click in here and I'm going to make this five. So I'm making the line thickness five. You notice when it first came on, it came on at 50. That gives me a, a very thick line. I actually only want to do five like this. So I get a narrow line. So at 27 and a half seconds, the pH was actually two. I know that because we did the experiment. And then I'm going to right click down here. Normally I could actually click at each step and tell it the concentration, but I'm going to cheat because we've been talking for almost 40 minutes now and I think some of us have to go to bed. Um, but I just right click down here. I'll tell it that that's pH 10 and hit done. So what it's now doing is I've now given it, um, I had pH steps as a function of time, but I've now told it at this time the, the concentration was this, and at this time the concentration was this. And with that then it's been able to calculate um, essentially my um, calibration curve. It's able to do all my, um, all my statistical analysis. I can um, output um, exports a PDF, I could download the data. So the reason I came to this was I was going to say essentially this, that you know we started off with a conversation about sweat. Sweat, um, can you can measure things like sodium and potassium in sweat. Those are iron selective electrodes. I would go the route of using the Sense It Smart. And even if you use the Sense It Smart, then you can process your data using uh, Julie and it will really speed up your data analysis and your data presentation. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nice. Ali's just saying, who's watching us online, that it's a nice database. And yeah, thank you for creating it. And I think I appreciate you guys who follow us on the vlog because Julie's really just in its infancy. Tonight I was talking about this whole thing about taking a nitrate measurement in the soil and putting it onto a smartphone so a farmer can take some action on that information. This is what Julie's really about. But of course, you know, it's a journey. So if some of you could be on that journey with us, absolutely fantastic. So let me go back to this. 
so I had this and said, look, you know, this is how you can, this is how we test a uh, sodium sensor. This is the data of our website. If you gather data like that, you can use Julie to analyze your data and it could be um, really speed up your analysis. So thank you for that. So in summary, I appreciate this has been long this evening. Um, we did the new section and then I did essentially a ZP developer zone um, section as well. So thanks guys. Um, if you want to be part of the discussion, please join the ZP Developer Zone. Um, my recommendation for the sweat sensor is, the initial question was how do I get the data off the EZ Flex? The EZ Flex is Bluetooth enabled and there is some software on our website that you can download and get the data off it. My recommendation is if you're in academia and you don't have a large engineering group around you and you're not really ready to launch a business and start that product development, go for the Sense It Smart. If you're in a business and you're wanting to create real products, let's say, then I would go for the Easy Flex. And thank you, Ali. I agree. Julie is a good product. I'll introduce you one day to the guy who originally conceived of it. His name is Sindra. Um, he lives in Norway and you can hopefully meet him. All right. So thank you very much, um, everyone, this evening. Um, thanks for the, listening to this rather long podcast and vlog. And... Um, those of you who are ZP Developer Zone members, we'll see you at 8 a.m. on Thursday, London time, for our normal um, live streaming webinar then. Okay, thanks, Ali, and thanks, guys. I appreciate it. All right, take care.